Hello, I am wine botherer in isolation, Joe Fatterini, and you are watching The Wine Show at Home. Play the theme tune. There is no theme tune, because I'm at home. Welcome to my attic, my wine attic. Nice to have you here. This is The Wine Show at Home. We're all tucked around. I'm doing this on my own. Well, not on my own. I've got an amazing team of people who are in their own homes who are helping me out. So thanks very much, Charlotte and Elle, particularly. You two guys doing the most amazing job. And Louis, thank you very much indeed, Louis. What are we going to do today? Well, I've got my sheet. I feel like this is like the wine version of the one show. I've got a, I've got a clipboard. I've got my clipboard here. Right, I'll go to a VT. No, we're not going to a VT. There is no theme tune. We are going and doing a tour around Britain's independent wine merchants. We are, and we've got some people emailing in already. Thank you very much indeed. Steve Good, he really liked it. He was commenting on Twitter actually after our last episode on Saturday. He said, most independent wine merchants now ship nationwide. That is very true. If you're concerned you can't get the wines, they will ship. Uh, Hennings in Sussex do and are flat out with deliveries right now. Steve, you read our minds because tonight's wines are from Hennings in Sussex. Isn't that bizarre? So they've got four shops. One is in the lovely village of Pulborough. Pulborough, I think it was, it was flooded, wasn't it? Early on this year. Um, I hope you're all right everyone in Pulborough. Hello. Got any people from Pulborough? Uh, there was one in Chichester, the home of, it was the birthplace of Tim Peake, the astronaut. Hello, Tim, if you're watching. We do have celebrity watchers. Um, hello, Louise People. Now, you might not know exactly who Louise is, but you will when I tell you what she was. She was a coconut in Kid Creole and the Coconuts. So hello, Lou. Nice to speak to you. I'm delighted we've got a coconut watching. We might, I'm going to try and find some wines. I've got some coconutty characters later on. Go and have it in. And um, there's other shops in Goring and Petworth. Remember Petworth. I'm going to come back to Petworth a bit later on. So we hope here at the wine show that we are making life a little bit more bearable for you at home. It's tough. We're all stuck in the house. We're hoping to bring some nice wines to make life pass a little bit more pleasantly. But we really hope that we are helping people who are not in their homes, people who are out and about looking after us. And with that in mind today, can we say thank you very much to everyone in the National Health Service. Isn't this great? I love this. Uh, for risking your health to go and look after ours. That is very kind of you. So thank you everybody indeed. And a special personal thanks, because we all got friends who are working hard, I'm sure. This is my best friend who's working hard, and that is Frank. We were school friends, we were about nine, and Frank is a paramedic now in Hampshire. So if you are ill in Hampshire and you get picked up by Frank, he will look after you. He's got the biggest hands of anyone I know, and that, there he is with a colleague, so working where there are Thank you very much, Frank, and all paramedics out and out. We will be giving our thanks to lots of people all around the country. And um, also, thank you very much because these shows are brought to you in association with various people who've helped make it possible. It's actually more complicated than I thought, making uh, home TV shows. And today, it's brought in association with Richard Brendan and Jancis Robinson Stemware, glassware, which we'll be using throughout the series. This is the Jancis Robinson One Glass, Richard Brendan. Um, they go for, they work for whites, reds, fizz, the uh, fortified the lot uh, and in fact we've got a question that's almost a seamless segue because if i have a look down here so tom sweetster sweetser our first question of the day what is the proper way to count a bottle of wine larger than 750 milliliters in a segue that is barely noticeable with a decanter that takes two bottles that's a magnum decanter from uh Jancis robinson and richard Brendan. Isn't it brilliant? So that's what you use. You do a decanter in, into, a, into a magnum decanter. That's the answer. If you've got anything bigger, you'll see behind me there's an enormous bottle. You just have to have several of these. Or you decant it into one of these, drink it, and then it back into one of these when you went to the other dinner. We may have more decanting questions later on, but let's start the drinking. Ha! So we are starting with a Muscadet today. This is good because Muscadet is fundamentally the most boring wine in the world. Or is it? That's the, that's the clue. It's not. This is Clos de Maronnières, Muscadet de Severet Mount, Surly, 2018, 1299. It's not actually that boring. The thing about Muscadet is that it's simple in the most delicious way. It's got a lovely, this is Surly, so it's got a slightly bready character to it, which is, comes from the uh, leaves that it sits on. 
but something beautifully simple. It goes brilliantly well with seafood. And it doesn't overwhelm seafood. You know, the worst thing you can go and have is with a beautiful piece of fish and then you can have a big buttery chardonnay. It ruins it. Mm. And the wines are fresh, fragrant, lifted, slightly floral. They're vinous, the taste of wine. But also, this is the magic of the wine show. I think this is why I go and do it, is that it sometimes opens a door to a world you didn't know. When we were, it was early on, I was reading up about Muscadet. I tell you what I found out. So Muscadet was planted, or around that part of France, it was near Nantes, remember Nantes, we'll come back to that, is planted by the Emperor Probus, Roman Emperor, fourth century. And he was the first person to plant vines outside Rome, really. In fact, he was the first person to authorise plantings in England. And he planted them in it's the vine in Hampshire, V-Y-N-E. Is it a National Trust property? Email in, text in, Instagram in, comment at the bottom of this, just below there. Um, and that was the first, they were the first vines in England were planted there under the authority of, of Probus. Anyway, um, Probus, you may remember, you may have been in a Probus club, but that's not the same as the Emperor, because that means it's for retired professional and business people. Pro-buzz-ness. Anyway, Probus plants the, these vineyards and he, he used soldiers who were, um, when they were not fighting, and he ended up killed him because he used them to do all sorts of other bits. And I think they were in modern day Kosovo or somewhere and he was making them drain a marsh or something and they all killed him because they were so cross having to do all this work. Anyway, so Probus plants it. They grow loads of red wine mostly in uh, that part of France on the sort of Atlantic coast until 1709. There is a horrendous frost. It was the coldest year in the last 500 years, I think. There's a lot of research around it now um, because there was sunspots. There were, no, there were no sunspots, so it got incredibly cold. And in Versailles, where the Sun King Louis XIV lived, it was so cold that if you had like a decanter of wine, decanter, again, by an open fireplace, it would still freeze and smash open the decanter. Barrels of wine froze in Burgundy. Um, and all the vines died. And they were replanted by the Sun King in 1710, the next year. And he was the man who said it should be replanted with Melon de Bourgogne, which is the great variety that is now used today to make Muscadet. So there you go, replanted by uh, Louis XIV, who you may remember on Saturday, remember I was talking about the weirdest thing I've drunk from, which was somebody's false leg. We won't carry on about that, but he had a gangrenous leg and they should have cut it off. But instead, they his doctors bathed it every night in burgundy that had been boiled with herbs. Didn't work. And he died, although he did die as the longest reigning monarch in history, I think. Um, yeah, I think to this day, it was like 72 years or something, he was king. Text in, email in, whatever. Get in touch if that is right. I'm pretty certain that Louis XIV was the longest reigning monarch, certainly in Europe and probably the world. Um, there was a Thai king, uh, Bouhimbol. He, he was almost as long, but not quite. On to the wines, more wines. Next wine, what do we have here? Claude de Morinier, Muscadet, uh, no, that was the one before. Domaine La Fouquette, Pierre de Moulin Rosé. So this is a Provençal Rosé from Hennings. Uh, this is 1550. They're nice wines, but you know what? A lot of these wines will go to restaurants normally, and they can't go to restaurants at the moment because the restaurants are all shut. So we should be drinking restaurant wines at home. Oh, that's lovely. Mm. Grapefruit. Grapefruit and sort of garig. Garigi spice to it. That is lovely. Um, I don't know, sit on your veranda if you've got a veranda. Uh, in your attic, you've got an attic, like me, uh, in your garden. That is perfect in the garden. Really lovely with pink food, but that grapefruit tang to it. It's not too acidic. Sometimes um, some people struggle a little bit because they can find uh, Provencal roses it's slightly too taut. This is not, this is lovely sort of soft uh, wine. It's classy wine though. Don't mistake rosé for being liberty gibbet nonsense. That's quite complex and there are layers to it. This is sort of creaminess and it evolves on the palate, sits there for a long time. Oh, wow, that's a lot. I thought it's some sort of prawn dish. And let's go and answer some questions. We've had loads, loads. Uh, the Big Fortified Tasting. Have you written a cryptic wine quiz for people to try during the lockdown? There are so many quizzes circulating, but none yet for wine. And we haven't, well actually I have. 
I was just thinking, actually, we should do this. We did a wine show quiz, and I wrote the questions, there were lots of wine questions. So what we'll do, Charlotte L, if you're watching, um, put them in the newsletter that we'll send out. And so what we'll do, go to the, the website, wineshow.com, um, if you subscribe to the newsletter, we'll add in the questions. There'll be a cryptic wine quiz in it. Um, I hope that's a good idea. There's possibly members of the crew going, no, that was a terrible idea because they're awful questions. Well, we'll put them in anyway. You can decide. But that's what, we, that's what we'll go and do. Hopefully that's good. Big Fortified Wine Tasting uh, was um, founded in part, I think, by Ben Campbell Johnson, who was at school with me and Frank uh, back in the day and died a few years ago. Really sad. No, ben, amazing guy. So, um, raise a glass to Ben there. Um, what else would you have? Tasting notes and track lists. Apart from California, which North American regions interest you the most? And are there any more recently planted varieties in the regions? Uh, yes, Sangiovese in Arizona it was one of the best wines we had in Series 1. And it was made by Maynard James Keenan, the, um, the rock star. Uh, do we have anything else? Lynn. I can't pronounce your surname, Lynn. Uh, hey Joe, can you recommend a great Riesling and Gewurz tram and a mix? Thanks, Lynn. Two, if you can find it, Aldi had one called Sear. Um, Sear Gewurz tram. It's an Australian blend. And also, but if you, it was quite cheap. I don't know if they've got it in anymore because it was quite a short run thing. Also, um, Larry Cherubino, the apostrophe stones throw or stones throw apostrophe or something, which also has, I think, some other varieties in, but it's brilliant. And I know Hay Wines have got that. And wineman.co.uk. It's quite a few merchants have got it. Look up Larry Cherubino. Brilliant wines from Western Australia. It's a great winemaker. Um, another question here. Susan May. Hello, Susan and Darren from Edinburgh. Hello. And Edinburgh talk like that. It's very well, very well to do. If you're a, if you like that. Unless you sound like Renton. I come from Glasgow. Uh, I did live in Glasgow 18 years. We might have more Glaswegian accents later. Constant dilemma. Old or new world Pinot Noir or both or neither cause South Africa Pinot Noir sort of sits between the two. It straddles both styles. If you're never sure in a wine tasting if it's old or new world, go for South Africa and you'll find it sort of sits between the, the pair of them. Time for some more wine. Red, we are going to Cote de Rhone because what we've got here, if I just turn my pages back, is Keran, Maximilien Domaine Les Grandes Bois, the big tree. Um, Les Grand Bois, the big trees. Um, Angie on Twitter says she likes Cote Rhone. This is a Rhone. Says she likes Cote Rhone with beans on toast. <laughs> Cheers, Angie. <laughs> I love that. Let's see if it goes with beans on toast. Perfect with beans on toast. <laughs> it's really lovely. It, I love Cote Rhone. It's got lots of Grenache in it. Um, various re villages in the Cote Rhone region can append their name, like Keran, Gigonda, Sable, Rasto, Vakira. I'm sure there are lots of others I can't remember right at the minute off the top of my head. But they're allowed to call themselves um, by their village name rather than Cote Rhone. But they all have this sort of heart of, uh, of Grenache that makes soft, ripe, easy drinking red. Yeah. That's lovely. That's a seriously classy wine. Fifteen ninety nine, actually. It's a really classy wine. Fifteen ninety nine. Lots of really lovely fruit and juicy flavours. You know what I want to drink that with? I mentioned Petworth before. I'm going to have a wine show book every day. It's not always a wine book. That is the wine book that I'm going to sit and drink with this. The Life and Death of Rochester Sneath. The reason that I got this one out, it's to do with... Um, it was a series of letters written by a student at Cambridge, I think, in the 60s, a guy called Humphrey Barclay, became an MP years later. Um, and he wrote to like sort of the Archbishop of Canterbury and the papal nuncio and people, uh, claiming to be the headmaster of a prep school near Petworth in West Sussex, where there's a Hennings. And they all wrote back, and people were taken in. Quite a lot of people got taken in by it. And when it was uncovered that he was the one who'd written them, um, he was sent down from Cambridge. I think he was asked to leave because it was caused us such a scandal. And it's a brilliant book. It's due a revival, actually, is The Life and Death, Death of Rochester Smith. If you can find an old copy, go and buy it. It's very, very funny. It's a great book. Great glass of red wine. This I am made. That is me tonight. That and that. Just going to quietly sit. No telly. Watched enough telly. Just quietly sit on the sofa 
reading a fun old book that I'd forgotten about, to be honest. I only uncovered this the other day because we're having a bit of a spring clean round here. Somebody re should republish this. I'll tell you the other bit. If you if you don't want to go and read Rochester Sneath, um, there's a friend of mine called Boris Starling. Hello, Boris, if you're watching. Brilliant novels. Download, um, my favourite is Visibility. But he wrote Messiah, which became a TV show years ago. Ken Stott. And Boris does this brilliant thing. If you invite him for a wedding, he'll... Um, if you, I think he's been a best man. He invites like the papal nuncio and the queen and the secretary general of the United Nations, and they don't come. But what happens is they send a letter. So when he does the bit and he says, "Well, we've got some letters from people who can't be with us today," uh, the secretary general of the United Nations congratulates the bride and groom on their wedding. But he sends he can't be with you, but he sends his best wishes. You know, the papal nuncio, you know, the, some equerry to the queen, writes back. Brilliant thing to do at weddings. There you go. Boris, nice to uh, have your tip in there. Uh, right, a couple, last couple of bits and pieces here. What do we have? I don't think we've had this one before, have we? Uh, Bill and Christina Melton. What's the difference? Bill and Christina. We met. I know them very well. I met several times in Maryland, United States. The Inn at Perry Cabin, where they filmed The Wedding Crashes. Remember The Wedding Crashes? With um, Luke Wilson, Vince Vaughan. And we met in that hotel there as a sort of food festival to say, what's the difference between aerating and decanting? Well, seeing as it is the Jancis Robinson, Richard Brendan supported episode, thank you very much, our partners, here's a decanter. Um, aerating is to let a wine open up a bit, pour it into a decanter, pour it back in the bottle. That aerates it. Particularly for young wines, you want to drink them a bit youthful, a bit more, a bit more youthfully. Decanting is to take the sediment off, which you want to catch in the shoulder of a bottle here. So you gently, slowly pour it in, catch the sediment. In fact, this decanter catches it in its shoulder there, and that so you don't get gritty bits in it. That's the difference between aerating and decanting. Thanks very much, Bill and Christina. Remember, send in your questions. Pop them in below this video now. And what else do we have? Betsy Freeman. Joe, have you had any wines from the mid-Atlantic region of the US? Lots of US correspondents. I've lived in Maryland, in Maryland, where the Inner Perry Cabin is, for about 35 years, and the wines have improved here incredibly. I don't think I've had a lot of Maryland wines. I've had them from Pennsylvania, the Pennsylvania Dutch, you know, like in Witness. And I've got to tell you, it was about 25 years ago, and they were execrable. They were absolutely appall appalling. So I will come, Betsy, and we'll try some of those wines. Um, what other questions do we have down here that I need to answer? Susan Roach. Hi, Joe and team. I really enjoyed the show. Thank you. I've missed the wine show. Looking forward to season three. So are we. Give it a few weeks. I think you should look into doing a season here in Tasmania. I know I'm slightly biased. I guess you live there. Uh, but I truly believe we have some fantastic wines here. You do live there. I do too. Coal River Valley for Reds. Amazing Cabernets. And then further north, um, bizarrely, you'd think it'd be the other way around, you get amazing sparkling wines around Ben Lomond. Weird wine facts because there's Ben Lomond in Tasmania, isn't there, which is the sort of lee of that is where you make the fizzes. You've also got Ben Lomond in South Africa, Lomond Wines, and Ben Lomond in California. There's one near Ridge Vineyards. There are no vineyards in Ben Lomond in Scotland. There you go. And final question from Liz Morin on Twitter. Should white wine and Cremont, you must have watched the other ep, be cold or just chilled? I defer to two friends here, actually. Um, Peter Richards and Susie Barry. You'll have seen them on Saturday... Uh, no, yes, yeah, Saturday Kitchen. And uh, they have a brilliant rule, the 2020 rule. Put all red wines into the fridge 20 minutes before you serve them. Take all white wines out of the fridge 20 minutes before you serve them because then you will find that the reds are just nicely chilled, especially a red like that, and the whites have allowed to all open up a little bit, they've warmed up. That's what I tend to follow. Look, it's been brilliant. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. I hope to see you again soon, tomorrow. We will be tomorrow. Um, Henning's Wines, thanks guys. Brilliant wines, absolutely glorious. Everybody go and buy yourself a nice mixed case from Henning's or your local wine merchants. Everybody stay at home, stay safe, come back tomorrow, Email your questions, drop anything, tell us what you like, tell us what you don't like, we'll change it. Thanks for joining us. Speak to you soon.